Welcome to the final topic in week three. This will conclude our discussion of how social structure affects the handling of legal cases. And after this week, we'll move on to talking about different stages of the legal process. But for today, we're going to talk about the topic of partisanship. And partisanship is another way that a third party can intervene in a conflict. So you have a conflict, and we can think of it as an interaction between two sides. There's the side that has the complaint or the grievance, you know, the alleged victim. And then there's the side that's the target of the complaint or the grievance, the alleged offender. And then you might have third parties who come and get involved somehow. And so compare today's topic to the topic we talked about at the end of last week, which was settlement behavior. Settlement's a way of handling a conflict in which the conflict is dealt with by a mostly neutral third party. So you have a third party who comes in like a judge or jury or court and hears the case and decides what to do about it. So the distinguishing feature of settlement is that it's mostly neutral. Maybe at the end, the settlement agent picks a side that they think is right or wrong, but they start off willing to hear both sides, and they intervene in a mostly neutral way. Partisanship's the opposite of neutrality. It's the opposite of settlement. It's taking sides right off the bat. A partisan is someone who takes one side against the other. And so we talked about how settlement was encouraged by several factors. It's more likely when the third party is some sort of social superior, such as a authority figure or a respected person. And it's also more likely when that third party is not too close to one side and distant from the other. That is, it's more likely when that third party is equally distant or close from both sides. That's the kind of social situation that encourages neutrality and not being very biased towards one side or the other so that you start off from the very get-go taking sides. Partisanship arises from exactly the opposite conditions. If being equally close to both sides encourages neutrality, being much closer to one than to the other encourages partisanship. Now, of course, which side you take in a fight depends partly on what people are actually doing. If you see one person committing some horrific crime, you might side against them even if they're pretty close to you. But all else equal, including the actual conduct of the people in the dispute, social closeness does exert an influence on whose side we take who we're more likely to see as being in the right, and how far we're likely to go to help out their side. So the relevant theory here is that partisanship is a joint function of closeness to one side and distance from the other side. So both variables matter. If you're close to both sides, you're probably going to be relatively neutral. If you're distant from both sides, you're probably going to be relatively neutral. But if you're much closer to one than the other, you're more likely to take sides. So partisanship becomes more likely when there's this imbalance in distance, and it becomes more likely to be strong. Because remember, partisanship is a matter of degree. Taking a side in a conflict might be as mild as just expressing a preference for one side or the other, saying, okay, well, you know, I see your point better than I see your point. But it might be as strong as thinking one side's completely in the right and the other side's completely in the wrong, maybe even evil, and also being willing to go very far to help out the side you think is in the right. I mean, at the extreme, it could be something like willing to lay down your life to take up their cause, to protect them or avenge them or whatever. And the greater the imbalance of relational distance, the more likely partisanship becomes and the more likely it is to be strong. So people tend to side with intimates against strangers, for example, with community members against outsiders. Cultural distance matters as well. All else equal, people tend to side more strongly with members of their own cultural group and against members of different cultural groups. Another thing that matters is social status. Higher status people generally speaking, have an advantage in attracting partisans. The wealthiest can sometimes hire partisans. They can just, you know, pay people to take up their cause. But people also might do it out of a sense of loyalty or out of respect. Versus those who are poor and disreputable often have a disadvantage in attracting others to take up their side. Doesn't mean it never happens. It's just all else equal. It's harder. And it's especially harder if they're opposing someone who's much higher in status, because then people who take their side also have an uphill fight on their hands. So in conflicts, the higher status side often has an advantage in getting partisanship, and partisans tend to gravitate towards the side that's closest to them, and will take that side more strongly to the extent that the other side's distant from them. So what's the relevance of partisanship to the handling of legal cases? Well, Mark Cooney talks about this in his chapter I assigned for today, evidence as partisanship, and he makes a really good point. In sociology of law, we focus on how the social aspects influence the handling of a case, and we tend to make a distinction between the social aspects and the legal aspects, because it's not like the social aspects are the only thing that matters. It does matter, you know, what the law says and what you're accused of doing and what evidence there is that you did it. That stuff does matter. It's just that there's wiggle room, and the social factors explain why it wiggles one way instead of another. But here's the thing. Even those technical factors, even those things that the legal rules say, have a social component. 
For example, whether someone gets convicted in court does depend on the evidence that they're actually guilty. What evidence is there they actually committed this crime that's forbidden by the rules? But how does one get evidence, right? Evidence is socially patterned as well. Evidence has to be produced by people. It's producing evidence is a human behavior just like any other aspect of law. You need to have people willing to gather evidence. You need to have people willing to come forward and talk to the police. You need to have people willing to come testify in court. And all these things are patterned by the human relationships involved. And so according to Cooney, high status people have an advantage in attracting witnesses and evidence. And people with lots of extensive social ties, people who find that all the third parties in the case are closer to them than they are to the opposition, also have an advantage in generating evidence. So if all the witnesses in a case of, say, assault, happen to be close friends and family to the alleged victim and strangers to the alleged offender, well, they're likely to show up and testify on the victim's behalf, versus the alleged offender might not have anybody there to back up his or her side of the story. And so there's an advantage to having close ties to people and having partisans willing to come and support you in court. Another way that partisanship is relevant to understanding the behavior of law is that we could look at law itself as taking sides, as being partisanship. And we've said before that law mostly acts as settlement. It's a way of taking a case before a third party who's, you know, hears both sides. But remember, authoritative settlement is relatively one-sided, which means eventually it does pick a side it thinks is the winner and a side it thinks is the loser. It, it does eventually declare someone in the right and someone in the wrong. So even if it's neutral enough throughout the process that we call it settlement, law does eventually take a side, and so and when it does, it's acting a bit like partisanship. And so we can use the theory of partisanship to explain which side the law ultimately takes. So legal officials, from the police to the court clerks to the prosecutor to the judge to the jury, we would expect them to have, all else equal, a bias towards those who are socially closer to them and against those who are socially more distant. For example, if I'm on trial in a small town, and the jury is mostly made up of people from that small town, and the person who has accused me of a crime is also from that small town and probably knows all of those jurors, at least knows their names and faces and, you know, friends of friends and that kind of thing. Meanwhile, I'm a stranger to the community. No one knows me. I'm going to be less confident in my ability to get acquitted of this crime than if the situation were reversed and the jury were all people from my hometown who knew, of, knew me or knew of me, and the person accusing me was the stranger from nowhere else. So you can see these kinds of advantages that build up when the people involved in hearing the case are socially closer to one side than the other. So one example Donald Black refers to in some of his work is the O.J. Simpson trials from the 1990s. O.J. Simpson, if you don't know, was a football star and actor, and he's an African-American, and he was accused of killing his ex-wife, a white woman, and you know, her friend or boyfriend, a white man. So you have a black man accused of killing two white people. And at his criminal trial, you have a jury that's mostly black. Nine of the 12 jurors were black, two were white, one was Latino. And the mostly black jury at his criminal trial voted not guilty. But then the family of the victims pressed charges in a civil court for wrongful death. They sued him for wrongful death. And in the civil trial, you had almost the opposite situation. The jury was mostly white. 11 of the 12 jurors were white, one was Asian. And here he was found liable for wrongful death. So one jury said, no, he didn't do it. Another jury said, yes, he did. And it so happened that the black man accused of killing white people was found not guilty by the black jury, but guilty by the white jury. Now there's some other differences here too. Civil trials have a lower standard of proof, but it seems silly to think that the composition of the jury had no influence. Or right, like in 1992, you had the case of several white police officers in Los Angeles accused of using excessive force against black motorist Rodney King, and they were acquitted by an all-white jury, which because the beating had been captured on camera and had become a national scandal, this was a famously controversial decision that outraged many people who thought, not without reason, that if it had been a jury with more black people on it, the officers would have been found guilty. And what's interesting is, in some times and places, this is so explicitly recognized that, that to ensure a fair outcome, the legal rules actually state that if you have a case that occurs between different social groups, the jury has to be comprised of members of both groups in even numbers to try to balance out this partisan effect. And you saw something like this in early colonial America, where you'd have cases between Indians, Native Americans, and white colonists. And some of the colonies had rules on the books saying in any case that involved members of both groups, you had to have a jury that was half Indian and half white. 